morning. My name is Verna Barrientos, and I have the pleasure of being your worship associate for today. Welcome, everyone. If you are here for the first time, if you're curious about our faith, welcome. If you've been here before, or if you're a longtime member, welcome back. Good to see you all today. All are welcome, whether you believe in God or a higher source. Hold to humanist or secular teachings if you come from another religion or if you've always been Unitarian Universalist, you are welcome here. The UU Cosite community welcomes people of all skin tones, the LGBTQ plus community, kids and mature folks, those with life challenges and those temporarily without such challenges. For here we are working to overcome our society's systemic biases and you specifically are most welcome. Today, the Reverend Renwa Hamami, the Executive Director of the UU Justice Ministry of California delivers, delivers a sermon entitled, A Gentle Angry People. The concept of mercy can have many different expressions based on its context. So how do we express mercy on our own? How do we experience and show mercy as Unitarian Universalists, people of faith and co-creators of justice? After the service today, I hope you will stay on Zoom to join our usual random smallish breakout groups that give us a chance to discuss thoughts from today's service. To that end, we'll post some prompts in the chat. Or we can just say hi to each other and reminisce about the bygone days of 2020. We want to thank UU San Mateo for administrative and professional support. And in particular to the Reverend Ben Myers, a consistent source of valuable guidance for us. For financial donations to UUCC, we have options for both online and by check. For detailed instructions, see today's order of service or in the email announcing this service. Calling all singers for a new adventure, the start of our very own UUCC choir. Tom Devine is looking for singers to encircle UUCC sermons with harmony and melody. It is easier than you think to sing along to a bass piano recording using headsets and your own smartphone. Please let Tom know if you're interested in joining the UUCC Choir. Join us on February 21st as Reverend Renwa Hamami returns with a workshop called Centering Love, Cultivating Liberation. What does a world with love at the center look like? What can we nurture in community that moves us closer to the world our Unitarian Universalist faith tells us is not just possible, but our responsibility to co-create? Join us as we'll together imagine a world centered on love, a world where there is always room. And now Tom will introduce our opening hymn. Thank you, Verna, and um, good morning. Hymn number 213, There's a Wideness in Your Mercy, is an old American folk hymn. The great hymnologist Alice Parker tells us that these folk hymns often come from folk songs, which are really dance tunes. And this tune has the sway of a waltz or a barcarolle. Think of the swaying of the sea, which is mentioned in the words. I'll play the melody once through, in case you don't know it, and then we'll start singing. So please rise in body or in spirit and sing and sway to him to teen. There is a wideness in your mercy. Oh. 
And now, Dave, please lead us in the lighting of the chalice. Good morning. Behold the lighting of the chalice, the UUC flame. Please join in reading the chalice lighting words from Reverend Richard S. Gilbert, Rise Up, O Flame. O flaming chalice, symbol of a free faith, burn with the holy oil of helpfulness and service. Spread the light, warmth and light and hope, warm hearts grown cold with indifference, light dark places with justice. Kindle hope and despair. May we bring fuel for thy fire of love. May the oil of loving kindness flow from us to thy leaping flame. May hands of service shelter thee, that no winds of hate extinguish thy brightness. May thy light and warmth be eternal. May we keepers of thy flame. Now Verna will lead us in sharing our joys and concern. One of the ways we create our beloved community is by sharing our own joys and concerns with one another and finding support from our community. So now we invite you to click the chat button at the bottom middle of your Zoom window. That will bring up a window in which you can type in your own joys and concerns if you have not already emailed them to us. As you do so, we'll hear Tom playing prelude number one from The Well-Tempered Clavier by Bach. We acknowledge the continued anguish of this pandemic, and we extend our gratitude to all essential workers who are so stressed at this time. May they be safe. We look with hope toward immunity to COVID-19 through vaccination, 
and are grateful that it is becoming available to more people. With joy, we affirm the safe and sane transfer of power in these past few weeks. We continue to hope for a constructive dialogue between the sides at every level of governance and down through our communities. We hope that democracy, a very Unitarian Universalist idea, continues to survive and thrive. Our song for the offertory this morning is Have You Been to Jail for Justice, written by Anne Feeney. Anne died last Wednesday of complications from COVID-19 at age 69. Our heart, our heart goes out to her family, to her friends, and to the many of us who were touched by her gifts. May we hold with love and care the joys and concerns that have been shared publicly today, as well as those that remain unspoken in the recesses of our hearts. In these times of reflection and renewal, let us remember that it remains important to reach out to one another, one another when we feel the need and to accept being reached out to. May we find comfort in knowing that we can share our joys and our concerns here among us. And now Tom will read an excerpt from Wendell Berry's forward to My Mercy Encompasses All, the Quran's teachings on compassion, peace, and love by Reza Shah Kazemi. Thank you, Verna. Wendell Berry writes, to think of oneself as an agent of God's anger is exceedingly attractive. Perhaps this is the temptation that the Lord's Prayer appeals to God not to, light, to lead us into. There are certain intense pleasures in anger, especially if one's own anger can be presumed to coincide with God's. And also in the use of an angry self-righteousness as a standard by which to condemn other people. This is a pleasure necessarily founded on the shallowest sort of self-knowledge. There is much comedy in this, as Shakespeare for one knew well, and also great tragedy. It is evidently possible to indulge one's own anger, justifying it as God's, and relying on God's mercy hereafter. But that seems to bet against great odds, and with hell to pay here and now for a lot of people. For those who appoint themselves agents of God's anger, there can be only division and strife until the end of time. To take up, by contrast, the agency of God's mercy seems to involve one in a labor of self-knowledge and then knowledge of others that is endlessly humbling. This is perhaps a comedy of another kind. We ourselves are in need of those things we are called upon to give to others, compassion, forgiveness, mercy. And unless we give them, we cannot receive them. God's mercy is of interest to us only in the light of our recognition of our need for it. Those who accept the agency of God's mercy understanding their own need for it as the index of the need of others, must forbear their anger and talk together until the end of time. For God's mercy is a mystery never to be fully known or enacted by humans. And now, please listen to a recitation of Surah Al-Fatiha, which means the opening, from the Quran, recited by Jennifer Grout. Uh, this, this surah or chapter is recited as the opening of every Muslim prayer, and you'll see a translation on the, uh, the slide that uh, we'll play while the uh, music, the recitation is playing. So. <laughs> بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين 
الرحمن الرحيم مالك يوم الدين إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين إهدنا الصراط المستقيم صراط الذين أنعمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الضالين آمين صدق الله العظيم الكريم With great pleasure, I introduce our worship leader today, Reverend Renwa Hamami. Reverend, R Reverend Renwa is, a, is the Executive Director of the Unitarian Universalist Justice Ministry of California, which supports UUs around the state in their various justice ministries by providing advocacy, education, and witness opportunities to live out our UU values. Reverend Renwa previously served as president of DRUM, Diverse and Revolutionary Unitarian Universalist Multicultural Ministries, a national organization for UU people of color. A self-described UU Muslim, Reverend Renwa seeks to serve both living traditions in her ministry, encouraging others both to grow and learn from each other's gifts, When not working, Reverend Renwas enjoys spending time baking absurd, absurd concoctions, <laughs> singing for liberation, and relaxing with their spouse and five fur babies. Reverend Renwa, we are so happy you are here to speak with us today. Thank you so much for that introduction, Verna, and it is my pleasure to be with all of you at UUCC <laughs> this morning. Um, as Tom mentioned, the Surah Al-Fatiha is the opening chapter of the Quran, literally called the opening, and is uh, a surah that I know quite well. Um, it is, as he said, a prayer recited multiple times during each, each of the five daily prayers that many Muslims observe. And I personally grew up saying this prayer at a variety of times when I was about to go on a trip, when I was about to take on a really challenging task. It was pretty commonplace in many of the beginnings or transitions in my life. These days, I don't say Surah Al-Fatiha nearly as much, but there is absolutely one experience when I know I will recite Surah Al-Fatiha without fail every single time I am in it. Now, about 99% of the time, I have a very fluid understanding of my relationship with the mystery that some of us call God or spirit of life or the divine, whatever name we may put to it. But in this one instance, this one experience, I revert back to a very strict theistic upbringing and a need to absolutely say Surah Al-Fatiha for God to hear. It's the one time I'm actually hoping there is some entity listening and looking out for me. And that's when I'm about to fly. It seems silly. And even in those moments just before takeoff, when I am praying away, some part of me knows that there really isn't much of an impact except my own comfort and ritual need. So why do I literally religiously do this? I found that this need only evolved as I grew older and realized how little was in my control. When I board a plane, when I fasten my seatbelt, when I stay seated until the captain turns off the fastened seatbelt sign and I can stand in line for the bathroom with everybody else, there is so much beyond my control. I am at the mercy of forces I am trusting to keep me safe and supported. The skills of the pilots, the working order of the machinery of the plane, the weather, and so much more. In that moment, I am putting my trust in people and in structures that have some degree of power over my comfort and safety. I am largely at their mercy when it comes to whatever help or harm I encounter in my travel. And in the midst of all of that fear and anxiety of flying, 
Those prayers give me comfort. Naming the reality of what is beyond my control, elaborating on the words of al Fatiha with my own prayers for the plane's mechanical soundness, the hearts, the minds, the eyes, the hands of the flight crew, the air surrounding us and carrying us to our destination, it reminds me of just how much holds me in its care, in its love, and in its mercy. Now, at the start of every prayer, including the recitation of Ofata, how we heard today, there is a phrase, a declaration that encompasses much of the Islamic traditions. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. In the name of the God, the most merciful, the most compassionate. Throughout the Quran and emphasized especially in Surah Al Fatiha is this merciful, compassionate nature of God, of the divine. And the depth of that mercy is better understood when we look at the Arabic behind that word. The words for all merciful, all compassionate, Rahman, Rahim, they share the same root, Rahim, which translates to womb like the womb of someone who was pregnant. The mercy of God or the divine is all encompassing. It surrounds us, cares for us, supports us, nurtures us. Like a developing fetus in a womb, we are at the mercy of forces that have power over our safety and well-being. We are dependent on care and love we receive without even knowing its fullness. Islamic theologians like William Chittick suggest that the realm of nature, the universe in its entirety, is this divine womb. In his reflection on the teachings of the Quran, Shah Kazemi describes these names of God in the Islamic traditions as giving voice to the creative impulse of divine love. Mercy as a reflection of a divine womb is rooted in the values of creation rather than destruction, connection rather than separation, care rather than disregard. And as another scholar, Mashid Ansari, writes in his own analysis of the nature of mercy in the Quran, mercy seeks to counterbalance the chaotic nature of our world today and focus on a real light that enables us to see and find this attribute of our Lord or the divine, and also to live and manifest this attribute as the prophets and saints have done in all of our traditions. And Sari's words remind us that by our very existence, we are reflections of life, of spirit, of source, our presence, our lives are the enactment and embodiment of that creative impulse of divine love. Within the Islamic traditions, one might say that we are the will of God. Our actions, when aligned with values of mercy and compassion, are the enactment of the holy. Put another way, we are created by the spirit of life, to be part of the spirit of life, to be stewards and care for the spirit of life. We hold so much power and responsibility. And yet we are still at the mercy of many things beyond our control, held by so much beyond our understanding. This reality can be a source of fear, but it can also be cause for incredible gratitude, awe, and humility. When we come to understand all of that mercy that surrounds us, we are better equipped to reflect and embody it ourselves. In our reading today, Wendell Berry shares that mercy seems to involve one in a labor of self-knowledge and the knowledge of others that is endlessly humbling. When we realize that we ourselves are in need of those things we are called upon to give to others, we are more willing to practice the challenging depths of mercy our universalism calls upon us. We realize that mercy is also our responsibility to give as reflections of that same divine love that has mercy on us. In its own roundabout way, the humility that comes from naming the mercy we receive 
is what allows us to name the power we have to enact mercy through our own words and deeds. The UU minister, Reverend Marlon Lavenhar, writes that mercy involves power. To show mercy to you, I must have something to offer you that I can choose to either give or withhold. Mercy is a way of using our power to show love and compassion. Now that power can take many forms and frankly, the nature of power itself is a source of a whole year's worth of sermons. But in the context of mercy, choosing to use that power to show love and compassion is perhaps the most essential element. Going back to the Islamic traditions, there is a story shared about how the prophet Muhammad used his demonstration of mercy to teach. There once was an old woman in Mecca who hated the prophet Muhammad. She hated him so much that every time she passed her, he passed her house every day, she would throw trash out of her window onto his head. And Muhammad would never complain. He would just simply continue on his journey as if nothing happened. And this continued day after day until one day, the prophet Muhammad passed by the old woman's house and no trash landed on his head. He looked around to see where the woman was. He became concerned when he couldn't see her. So he knocked on her front door and heard a feeble voice say, come in. When he entered the house, he found the old woman in bed looking scared. Was Muhammad going to shout at her or punish her for throwing trash on, her, on his head every day? <laughs> Don't be scared, Muhammad said. I'm not here to shout at you. Muhammad quickly realized that the woman was very sick and was unable to leave her bed. So he went about cleaning her house and making sure that she had everything she needed to be comfortable. And by the end of this, the old woman was so impressed by Muhammad's behavior that she decided to never throw trash on his head again. In this story, the prophet Muhammad showed mercy in a situation where he could have chosen something else. He chose to show love and compassion to someone who had refused to do the same. And in doing so, it gave her an opportunity to follow suit. By choosing mercy, by choosing to show love and compassion, Muhammad claimed his power in that moment and used it to remind the woman that she could use her own power in her relationship to Muhammad differently as well. In another story, Muhammad is said to have told his followers, help your brother, whether he is oppressed or an oppressor. His followers, confused, asked, it is right to help the oppressed, but how do we help the oppressor? And Muhammad simply replied, by helping them to no longer oppress. Now, obviously there is much more complexity to that work than simply saying, stop oppressing. But underlying that teaching is an awareness that when we are able to show mercy, recipients who are willing to see it may be more willing to engage it in themselves in the future. To give you a more personal story, when I was in seminary, I lived in a dorm setting where around 20 of us shared a single kitchen. Now, each of us had a bit of space reserved for our personal cookware and food. And one evening, I was feeling particularly stressed, but I went to grab my kitchen pot to make dinners for the week. It was nowhere to be found. I tore that kitchen apart, and I admit I was not on my best behavior, muttering, slamming cabinet doors, feeling righteously offended by what felt like a huge violation of my personal space. After about 10 minutes of this, I huffed my way into the adjacent common room where a couple of my classmates were sitting with visiting family members and angrily asked them if they had seen my pot. Obviously, they hadn't but I still ranted about it going missing, eventually resigning myself to using one of the many communal pots available for cooking. The next day, I got a knock on my dorm room door. It was my classmate who had been in the common room that evening. And showing mercy, compassion, and love, she explained to me how my actions that evening were hurtful to her and her family. My classmate and her family are Black. And my aggression and tone that evening came across as accusatory, as though I had believed that one of them had taken my pot. She patiently explained to me how my actions, even if not intended as such, were anti-Black. I was angry, I was hostile, 
And even if not intending to, I ended up accusing them of theft. I had used my power that evening in a way that deprived them of safety and welcome, and instead leaned into my more wrathful and angry side of my humanity. See, it was my classmate who showed mercy the next day with her actions to approach me, not necessarily knowing what response she would get. Would I double down? Would I deny it? Would I accuse her of being too sensitive? She chose mercy by claiming her truth and bringing it to me. She chose mercy by choosing to trust that I could learn from her and be changed by her story. She chose mercy by inviting me to consider the power that I have as a person of color that can still perform and engage in anti-Blackness and how I can and must choose differently if I am to embody that creative impulse of divine love. My classmate showed me mercy by inviting me to realize that I had caused harm holding me accountable to it and encouraging me to learn and teach from that experience. She showed me mercy by her choice to love, not by letting the harm go unchecked, but by challenging me to own it, repair it, and learn from it. She helped this oppressor in that moment begin to no longer oppress and practice a mercy of my own. Now in today's world, <laughs> where there's so much oppression, so much systematically reinforced suffering, what is our relationship and responsibility to the practice and experience of mercy? One of my favorite teachers, the author, activist, doula, artist, and scholar, Adrian Murray Brown, offers us the language of a principled struggle, which she writes is when we are struggling for the sake of something larger than ourselves and are honest and direct with each other while holding compassion. See, as Unitarian Universalists, we believe in the inherent worth and dignity of every person, then mercy must be understood as something that is not only reserved for those who are deserving of it, which I'll be honest, is a really hard and humbling pill to swallow, and real talk, some days I will spit that pill out. There is a rightful hesitation around the idea that mercy is for everyone. When there are some in our world who engage in such tremendous abuses of power, that it would be unjust and frankly violent to ask victims and survivors of their harm to show them love and compassion. As Brown writes, shaming behaviors of abuse in a culture where they have been normalized is and has been a necessary survival technology. Some things we need to loudly say no to, which in and of itself is an act of mercy, a claiming of our power to show our anger in response to harm claiming of our power to show our refusal to allow violations of human dignity to go unchecked, a claiming of our power to refuse to ignore when someone has strayed so far away from that creative impulse of divine love that they have become a destructive force of hell and hate. So yes, we do need to be aware of the danger of mercy being misused or exploited by the harm doers who refuse to acknowledge the power they hold or those who use that power in a way that harms others with no way of avoiding it. Mercy doesn't excuse the intentional behaviors of people who use power to injure or have exerted power over as a means of oppressing or denying the worth and dignity of others. Recent public figures who have made calls for healing and unity while denying any responsibility for the division and dehumanization they continue to intentionally so are maybe not quite ready to receive mercy. But then there are those who, for some, mercy is well overdue. While there are interpersonal and individually based means of practicing mercy, those cannot have the fullest impact without also examining the systems and structures being challenged in public light more and more through the lens of mercy. In quoting her own teacher, Ruth Wilson Gilmore, Adrian Murray Brown writes, instead of asking whether anyone should be locked up or go free, why don't we think about why we solve problems by repeating the kind of behavior that brought us the problem in the first place? In this moment, Brown is referencing mass incarceration, the prison industrial complex, and the racism inherent to our police struggle structures that are one place that desperately needs us to engage and dismantle with reflections of sacred mercy. 
Just a couple of years ago, UUs around the country engaged in that common read of Just Mercy by Brian Stevenson, which took a deep and painful look at the violence perpetuated by the prison industrial complex, particularly against Black individuals and communities. Stevenson describes his book as being about how we easily condemn people in this country and the injustice we create when we allow fear, anger, and distance to shape the way we treat the most vulnerable among us. Our systems of incarceration and policing are designed to, quote, communicate our toughness and reduce people to their worst acts and permanently label them as the worst decisions they have ever made. Our systems of incarceration and policing, the prison industrial complex that seeps into our schools and financial institutions, they fail to acknowledge how our power as a society, and especially those of us with economic and racial privilege, have been used to maintain and cause more harm to the most vulnerable and oppressed in our communities. Stevenson writes that each of us is more than the worst thing we have ever done. And if we genuinely affirm the inherent worth and dignity of every person, then we must affirm that of every one. Even those individuals who have put so much distance between themselves and their inherent dignity with their actions, mercy sees that distance and knows that if an individual is willing to acknowledge how they have harmed and work to repair as best they can the harm they have caused, then there is a way back to that inherent worth and dignity through our compassion and love that provides teaching, accountability, and relationship to help them find their way. So what keeps us from showing mercy in those instances when it's possible that someone would be open to naming how they have harmed, when we have that opportunity to demonstrate our power in a compassionate way? Adrian Mary Brown suggests that we are fearful of taking the time to be discerning because then we may have to recognize that we aren't as skilled as we want and need to be, or that any of us could be seen as harm doers. Mercy means we need to acknowledge that we may not be as innocent as we think, and that we too act in ways that need mercy and compassion ourselves. Sadly, our criminal justice system is nowhere near merciful. In fact, it is the opposite. Rather than interrogate the circumstances that might lead individuals to engage in what has been categorized as unlawful or harmful behavior, or engage our fellow humans with the basic curiosity or compassion they deserve, Stevenson writes that incarceration becomes the answer to everything. Healthcare problems like drug addiction, poverty that had led someone to write a bad check, child behavioral problems, and more that are not treated with an awareness of our power to provide compassion and care that addresses the root needs behind these actions. Rather, we abuse our power as a society and punish the most vulnerable because it is easier and it allows us to avoid any sense of culpability or complacency in their circumstances. With mass incarceration and the prison industrial complex, those of us with the racial and economic privilege are able to hold tightly to a victim role rather than acknowledge the scary and painful truth that we could be harm doers too. Mercy in its fullest form would hold all of us in a recognition of the fact that we all are harmed and cause harm. Or as Stevenson writes, we all share the condition of brokenness, even if our brokenness is not equivalent. There is strength in naming our brokenness power in claiming it, and mercy in doing something compassionate with it. And in light of that reality, we must listen to the increasing calls from organizers, Black and Brown communities, and immigrants that are calling to defund the police and abolish prisons. We need to hear them as invitations to practice a sacred mercy. They are calls for us to acknowledge how power has been used to cause harm, identify a more compassionate power rooted in our shared brokenness, humility, and humanity, and transform that toughness into curiosity, accountability, care, and mercy. The calls to dismantle these systems of centuries-long racial and economic oppression and abuse are not designed to lead to chaos. They are intended to bring us back into relationship with each other, our common humanity, and our creative impulse for divine love. There are calls for us to be a gentle, angry people. 
Towards the end of this book, Stevenson reminds us that our interconnected and interdependent existence is central to our practice and experience of mercy. He reminds us that even as we are caught in a web of hurt and brokenness, we're also in a web of healing and mercy. It is messy, it is hard, it is sacred, and it is exactly where we need to be on our shared journey of humanity. Our intricately woven connections to each other our patient willingness to help one another return to our inherent worth and dignity, our humility to know that we will be on the receiving end of compassionate accountability on multiple occasions. They are what will help us create a more just, peaceful, and merciful world. Thank you so very much, Reverend Renwa, for your wonderful, powerful sermon. And now let's sing together hymn 170, We Are a Gentle, Angry People. We are a gentle, angry people. And we are singing, singing for our lives. We are a gentle, angry people. And we are singing, singing for our lives. We are a justice-seeking people. And we are singing, singing for our lives. We are a justice-seeking people, and we are singing, singing for our lives. We are young and old together, and we are singing, singing for our lives. And we are singing, singing for our lives. We are a land of many colors. And we are singing, singing for our lives. We are a land of many colors. And we are singing, singing. Reverend Renoir has given us generous, generously of her time and multiple talents. Let us take a moment now to exercise that all-important generosity of spirit with an offering that supports the mission and service of UUCC. For the generosity you display by being present here and the generosity of all of those who support this community with time, with talent, with treasure, with trust, we thank you all most profoundly. If your generous spirit does move you today, please feel free to contribute what you can to UUCC, either by check or online. Please follow the instructions in today's order of service. Our song for the offertory this morning is, Have You Been to Jail for Justice? 
Written by Anne Feeney, who died last Wednesday of complications from COVID-19 at age 69. The song reminds us of times when goodness and mercy were in short supply, when slavery and child labor were normal, when the idea of voting for women was a pipe dream. And it speaks of those who acted as instruments of change, the people who stood up, who faced their oppressors, who defied those who would have perse persevered the status quo, who defied the law, who laid their lives on the line and in some cases lost them, people who gave all they had. Anne Feeney encourages us to take these people as our exemplars, to stand as they stood, to protest, to give all that we can. While collections take place, let us take a few moments to hear Mo Robinson and Pamela sing a protest song from the 60s, Have You Been to Jail for Justice? Was it Cesar Chavez or Rosa Parks that day? Some say Dr. King or Gandhi set them on their way. No matter who your mentors are, it's pretty plain to see. If you've been to jail for justice, you're in good company. Have you been to jail for justice? I want to shake your hand. Sitting in or lying down are ways to take a stand. Have you sung a song for freedom? Or marched that picket line? Have you been to jail for justice? Then you're a friend of mine. You law-abiding citizens, listen to this song. Laws are made by people, and people can be wrong. Once unions were against the law, but slavery was fine. Women were denied the vote while children were the mind. The more you study history, the less you can deny it. A rotten law stays on the books till folks like us defy it. Have you been to jail for justice? I want to shake your hand. Sitting in or lying down are ways to take a stand. Have you sung a song for freedom or marched that picket line? Have you been to jail for justice? Then you're a friend of mine. The law's supposed to serve us, and so are the police. But when the system fails, it's up to us to speak our peace. It takes eternal vigilance for justice to prevail. Get courage from your convictions, let them haul you off to jail. Have you been to jail for justice? I want to shake your hand. Sitting in or lying down are ways to take a stand. Have you sung a song for freedom or march that picket line? Have you been to jail for justice? Would you go to jail for justice? Have you been to jail for justice? Then you're a friend of mine. I will now extinguish candle flame. Please join in reading these words by Elizabeth Sellett Jones. We extinguish this flame, but not the light of truth, the warmth of community, or the fire of commitment. These we carry in our hearts until we are together again. This was a wonderful and very timely service today. Thank you, Reverend Renwa, for your inspirational words. We want to acknowledge our first Sunday production team, pianist and hymn coordinator, Tom Devine, artistic director, Noreen cooper Heblin, and our session management engineer, Bruce Raffnell. We also want to acknowledge our singers, Mo Robinson, Pamela Carrington-Tribble, Linda Grace Frost, and Tom Devine.
Thanks to all of you for participating in this timely service. And thank you all for being here today. I hope you'll all join us in the breakout rooms immediately following. We would like the breakout rooms to be a safe space where we can talk openly and honestly about our topic today. We also want to remind people that what is said here stays here, but thoughts and concepts we learn and are inspired by can most definitely be shared. Please be thoughtful of the time so that anyone who wishes to speak has the opportunity to do so. Here are a few things to consider in your discussion, but don't feel obligated to answer these questions as these breakout rooms are intended to be a free flowing sharing of thoughts and sentiments, whatever they may be. Perhaps pick one topic that speaks to you to discuss with the group or not. How are mercy and pity different? How might they show up in our justice making? When have you exercised mercy in your life? When have you received it? In just a few moments, we will give everybody permission to unmute themselves. Have a wonderful week and stay safe. <laughs>